We're going to be studying about specifically the harlot of the book of Revelation and show you a clear biblical based on the Bible, going to the Bible itself to understand these interpretations, understanding of this entire issue concerning the harlot in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. And we've spoken about this a couple times before already, but we're really going to get into some details about this tonight. And this is going to bless your soul and keep this, uh, share this amongst your friends with Facebook right now. And it's through YouTube so we can get more folks watching as well as a link on Facebook to this study here tonight. So tonight, once again, I'm going to show that first century Jerusalem was the harlot of the book of Revelation. And I've got artwork that's been provided graciously by David Miles and Duncan Long. And I'm going to read the first six verses of Revelation chapter 17. And so, if you have your Bibles, you can turn along. There's going to be a lot of scriptures on the screen as well. But Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 to 6, There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked, unto, talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Now notice where this is. It's, it's an uninhabitable region, the wilderness. Uh, it reminds you of leaving Egypt and Israel going through the Exodus on their way uh, to Canaan, passing through this wilderness, the in-between period, the period where the enemy worked. And this is where the Spirit is showing John where this harlot is. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet-colored, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Such a deceiving sight John was seeing. And... Let's begin, and I want to take you now to the book of Genesis, chapter 2, and we're going to go to verse 17, and then into chapter 3 of Genesis. So Genesis chapter 2, the Lord really impressed on me a couple decades ago now, that the first several chapters in the book of Genesis set the pace for the whole prophecy and the whole word of God in the Bible. Uh, first impressions are important and God set everything in order in the book of Genesis first few chapters. In fact, a lot of scholars have called these first several chapters up to chapter 11, the seed plot of the Bible. In other words, everything that you read in the rest of the Bible grows and progresses from its their beginnings in Genesis. And, and the book of Revelation is like the harvest of that seed plot. And you're going to see a lot of parallels between Genesis beginning things and Revelation bringing an ending. But in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And then chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Notice there's a beast at the beginning of the Bible, as well as in the end in the book of Revelation. This is no coincidence. They're met, meant to be connected in your understanding. And he said unto the woman, 
Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. So, from understanding, studying the word of God, Satan, Jesus even spoke of falling from heaven like lightning. And he entered the garden, and the Bible informs us by comparing Revelation chapter 12 with Genesis that the devil possessed the serpent. Uh, Genesis chapter 12 verse 9 calls the dragon that John sees in a vision, that old serpent. And it's a direct reference to the book of Genesis and what you're reading, what you're reading there. Everything's working now? I just saw some notes that some folks said nothing was on live. Hopefully this is on live now. Just let me know. So the woman heard a word from the serpent. Get the picture we're seeing in the book of Genesis. The woman listened to a lie, but it was a word from the serpent. And it's interesting because the words are very important in the book of Genesis. God spoke the word and created all things, but the devil had his word as well. And it was a lie. God's word is only truth. And it's the only word intended for your hearts to receive and to believe. And of course, we can believe a lie if we're not careful. And this is what was happening with the woman. And so she adulterated away from God's word. Now, you understand through the Bible that adultery can be spiritualized in the form of idolatry. God talked about uh, Jerusalem committing fornication with the kings of the earth and with false gods and said he's a jealous God and doesn't want us going to other gods. The serpent was called more subtle than any beast of the field. And he just added one simple, in English anyhow, three-letter word, and corrupted the entire message that God was trying to get to Adam and that woman. He added the word not. And so his idea was to attack the word. And by attacking God's word, he could succeed. And it still happens today. He attacks the word of God, puts questions in people's minds. And there's nothing wrong with having questions because it'll make you search and want to learn more. But if it's a question, questioning God's integrity and God's character, well, that's a different story altogether. God said in Genesis 2 and 17, thou shalt surely die. The serpent said in Genesis 3 and 4, you shall not surely die. Notice very similar, but just a slight difference. That little word caused a lot of damage. And he's referred to as a beast. So the beast is giving a word that is a lie. Now, the Bible tells us in Genesis 1 and 11 that fruit has seed within itself and it brings forth after its kind. In fact, if you look at the first chapter of Genesis very carefully and you read what God did on those seven days, there's more words and more time spent in verse 11 on fruit and those trees that bore fruit and their seed, and explaining even what the seed was for, than anything else except the creation of man himself. And that's because fruit and trees were going to play a big part in man's existence in the Garden of Eden. And uh, there was the fruit of life and the tree of life, and there was the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And it, they both had seeds within themselves. Now, the word which was a lie from the serpent was a seed that the woman received in her heart. You see, Jesus gave a parable, one of his most famous parables, the sower and the seed. 
And that word of God was represented by a seed. And to get it into our hearts was like the seed being planted in soil. And so with this introduction, I want us to pray right now because we're getting into the word of the Lord. We want truth, his word, not a lie, to be planted into our hearts and to grow. And, and let's thank God for his word right now. And let's believe God as we make this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, as we open our hearts to your word, guard our hearts against any lie from the enemy. We want truth, Lord. We want to know what your word is actually saying. Because Paul the Apostle even talked about people resting or wrestling the scriptures and distorting them so that people receive a misunderstanding and an incorrect understanding from the word. Don't allow us to receive a twisted version, God. Help me and help everybody watching this receive truth. Correct our misunderstandings. Give us a genuine word of God. And we believe and thank you for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank the Lord. So there is also what is called a serpent seed doctrine. And that's not what we're talking about whatsoever tonight. The serpent seed doctrine teaches that the eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was... Um, a metaphor for sexual act with the serpent, as though people literally have children. Uh, Eve literally bore children for the devil. And of course, that's, that's, I don't believe that. I don't agree with that whatsoever. It's not true. But the lie that he told her was like a spiritual seed, not a physical seed. She did not receive a physical seed from some sexual act. It was a spiritual seed into the heart, just like the word of God is a spiritual seed that's planted in the soil of our hearts. Her heart believed a word. That's what it means to receive a seed. In other words, her heart adulterated from God. Our hearts must believe only what God's word says and not a lie. And according to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 14, the woman was deceived. And so, the beast, in other words, the serpent, the most subtle beast of the field, succeeded in adulterating the woman. And there you see an artist's rendition of the woman taking this fruit from the serpent, which I believe physically represented what was happening happening spiritually and that word just like that fruit she took and ate had a seed in it that would be planted in her heart now let's shoot ahead in time to daniel chapter 2 in the book of daniel where nebuchadnezzar had a vision of kingdoms and he was the king of babylon in his vision he saw an image of a man and let's look at that in Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 to 35. Daniel is also a parallel with the book of Revelation. Another parallel, a really intense parallel with the book of Revelation is the book of Ezekiel. But uh, let's go to where Daniel recounted this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. In verses 31 to 35... We read, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. And this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And thou sawest, till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and silver and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. And then when you go to the verses 37 to 35, uh, rather 45, 
It says Daniel gave the interpretation of what that head of gold was. He said, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And it was the world power at the time Daniel wrote. And these subsequent kingdoms would also be world powers. And it says, Wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the heavens hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all, thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kingdoms shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. Take note of that. All these other kingdoms from Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, there were four of them, the fifth one would be the kingdom of God. And it wouldn't be left to other kingdoms like the previous ones were. The previous kingdoms, all of their territories fell into the hands of the next one. But the kingdom of God is the last one. And it won't fall into the hands of anybody once God has control. And it shall stand forever. It'll consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, silver, and gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So, notice it was the image of one man. All of these kingdoms, it's like the kingdom of mankind. And that image was Adam. This is Adam's race forming kingdoms and in god's eyes and we actually preached this very recently everybody is in one of two people in the earth adam or the last adam jesus christ adam was this image that nebuchadnezzar saw and in it were four kingdoms his race is a race of sinners and they all came from Eve who adulterated with the word of the beast and got the seed of the beast in her heart when she should have had God's word in her heart. And Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 actually calls sinners the children of disobedience. So let's look at these four kingdoms. The head of gold is Babylon. The arms and the chest of silver represent Medo-Persia. Notice the dual aspect, two arms. Medo-Persia was a dual kingdom, and it actually came into power in Daniel chapter 11 during Belshazzar's feast, and you all heard about the writing on the wall. And then after him in his kingdom was the belly and thighs of brass, which represent Greece. And then finally the legs and the feet of iron, mixed with clay, which represents Rome. Now, Daniel 7 shows these same four kingdoms as four beasts. Daniel 2 shows them as segments of a man's image or idol. And chapter 7 talks about the same four kingdoms, but refers to them this time as beasts. Now, I do want to say, there's so many odd interpretations going around where the lion represents England, or the uh, eagle represents the United States. And But I do want to mention something to you. When Daniel saw this lion with eagle's wings, it wasn't England, it was Babylon. In fact, right on the walls of Babylon, it showed a lion's body with eagle's wings and a man's head. And it's so interesting because that 
exactly was what God's word described Babylon as. And then people have come up with some novel ideas and some fancy interpretations and have written lots of books about how the lion is Britain. But their mistake when they look at that is they see the lion's wings were plucked off and stood up like a man. And the people that think this is referring to modern kingdoms say that those wings of eagles represents the United States because the United States uses the eagle as a symbol and England uses the lion, the lion of Britain. And they think that the eagles being plucked off are the elements that stand up like a man, as if the eagle's wings turn into a man and they would say that's Uncle Sam. That's not what the vision said. The vision said that the lion stood up like a man once the eagle's wings were plucked off. In other words, the lion was able to fly, but when its eagle's wings were removed, it had to stand and walk like a normal man. So you can see through false misunderstanding and false interpretations of Bible prophecy just by looking at the words carefully. It says it stood up as a man, not they. It would have been they if it was referring to the wings. But because it wasn't referring to the wings standing up, but the lion standing up, it said it stood up. So no, this is not Britain. It's not the United States. The bear is not Russia. You can't take symbols that natural worldly people refer to. People think the bear is Russia. They think the lion is Britain. You've got to go what God's symbols are. And God's symbols say that the lion with the eagle's wings is Babylon. And Medo-Persia was the uh, chest and arms of silver. And Greece was the belly of brass and Rome. So it's not any four different kingdoms separate in chapter 7 from chapter 2. Chapter 2's kingdoms are the same kingdoms in chapter 7. It's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now when you go to chapter 7, look at verses 2 to 7. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. If you go to Revelation 13... You also see the winds blowing on the sea. But instead of four kingdoms like is in Daniel 7, one kingdom rises in Revelation 13 because in John's day when he wrote the book of Revelation, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece had all gone and Rome was in power, the fourth beast. And that's, that's a, a, an interesting thing that in the days of the fourth beast, a whole book was written called the book of Revelation. But it said that the four winds came on the, strove upon the great sea, and the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion, the second like a bear, another like a leopard, and a fourth beast. And look how much description we read about this fourth beast. Dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. It's like this: these iron teeth would bite, and the beast would shake itself, and the residue would fall down, and he would stamp on the residue with his feet. So, very important, there were only four beasts, not Five. The reason I say that is because another teaching says that after Babylon, Merino, Persia, Greece, and Rome, there's another one, like a revived Roman Empire that hasn't even happened yet. There were no lapses of time between the Babylonian kingdom and the Medo Persian kingdom. In fact, I already mentioned Daniel chapter 11 shows us. When Belshazzar's feast took place, that the Medes and the Persians came in. And Daniel remained there and came under the new kingdom, Darius, or Darius, and he was of the Medes and the Persians. And then after the Medes and the Persians, the Grecians took over. And after the Grecians, the Romans took over. There wasn't thousands of years between these kingdoms, just like there's not a fourth kingdom called Rome with thousands of years and then a revived Roman Empire. That would be five kingdoms. They could call it revived all they want, but 
when it said that the legs were of iron and the feet of iron and clay, it's still the same Roman Empire that becomes corrupted and divided. And that already happened centuries and centuries ago. So there's no power after Rome that's part of that image that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And Rome ended way back in the first few centuries of this new era since Jesus Christ came. And when you go to Revelation 13, you see the same picture. And that's what I was mentioning a little earlier. Revelation 13 and 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea, saw a beast, not four, but one, rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. But he only saw one, where Daniel saw four. And there's a picture of something similar to what Daniel would have seen in his vision. You see, he saw visions, and God was relating truth to him through these visions and pictures. And as we've already learned, especially last week, we're meant to read the rest of the Bible, like Daniel, to understand these visions. So the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7, I'm going to compare that with John's vision. In Daniel 7, verses 3 to 7, the first beast was like a lion, second like a bear, another like a leopard, a fourth beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. John, in Revelation 13 and 2, watch how the fourth beast, just one beast he saw, but it had all the qualities of the previous three, although they were gone. Revelation 13, 2, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And if you keep reading, his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. The lion was the first beast Daniel saw. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. The leopard was the third beast Daniel saw. The bear was the second beast he saw. So the lion, the leopard, and the bear, all these previous three beasts before the fourth one, were all amalgamated, so to speak, in this fourth kingdom. Then, in Revelation 12, this is before chapter 13, we read of a red dragon. Now watch this carefully. Verse 3, There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Notice how many horns there are. How many heads there are? How many crowns there are? Revelation 12 and 9 says that that dragon was cast out. That was the old serpent. Now we're getting a direct connection to the book of Genesis, right in Revelation itself. It's the old serpent. It's telling you, think back to an ancient serpent in the word of God. And he's called the devil, Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. People wonder, was that serpent the devil or was it... It says in Revelation 12, it was Satan. It was the devil. And there's the vision John saw. And it's a red dragon. That's the devil itself, himself. And he's attacking this woman. Now, isn't that interesting? The dragon, which is called the old serpent, is attacking a woman. Just like the serpent in the book of Genesis was attacking the woman. There is a connection that we're going to see come forth greater and greater as we study here tonight. Now, when you compare the dragon and the fourth beast, there are close similarities. Revelation 12 and Revelation 13, one chapter right after the other. The dragon and the beast both have seven heads and ten horns. And that's why we read the dragon gave power to the beast. The heads represent power and the horns so forth. And it's like the head of something is the authority over it. So the dragon gave his authority to this beast. That was this fourth kingdom that Daniel saw. And that was the kingdom of Rome that rose up in the days of John the Revelator. And it was in effect and in power over the earth in the time of the early church and Jesus Christ's own ministry on the earth. 
So the fourth beast is Rome, and he only saw that one beast because Babylon, Greece, Medo-Persia had already risen and gone. Rome was the fourth one. It was in power. And the serpent that deceived Eve has now evolved into a dragon. The only evolution that's in the Bible is the devil evolving into something worse than what he was. He was only a serpent in the book of Genesis, but I believe it's because spiritually speaking, God told him that he would he would eat the dust of the earth. That would be his food. Our flesh was made from the dust of the earth. He feeds on mankind's fleshliness, our uh, uh, weakness and susceptibility to sinfulness because of our flesh. Because we ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil in our parents, Adam and Eve, that's in us now. And that drive that's bending us to go toward these things, it's a force and it's a power. It's what causes the works of the flesh are adultery and lust and murder and hatred and witchcraft and all of these things. And it's fed upon that for so long that it's become a monster and a dragon by the time of the New Testament. But although the devil's power became very dark and very powerful, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Praise God. And that dragon now has seven heads and ten horns by the time Jesus Christ comes. And it gives power to the fourth beast. And now it's more like the devil than the previous four kingdoms. Why do you think the beast in Jesus' day was more like the devil than all the previous kingdoms? It was because Satan was going to attack Jesus Christ. Speaking of Daniel, the devil knew the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 that after 62 weeks, Messiah would come. Once the temple was commanded to be rebuilt, according to Daniel 9, count the clock and 62 times seven years brings you to the time of Jesus Christ. And the devil realized that was going to happen gathered all his efforts and power up to come against this son of God. The devil thought it was Moses, and that's why Pharaoh had all of the children killed. The devil thought it was through Abraham, and and that's why he attacked the woman. And and Sarah was barren, and and Rebecca was barren, and, and Rachel was barren. All of these women were attacked by the enemy from bringing forth a child because Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 says that the seed of the woman was going to bruise the head of the serpent and he was frantic, uh, insane in, in fearing for himself and attacked womanhood all through the word of God. And so by the time Jesus came, the devil had mustered up his power to be the most devilish kingdom in the world that would seek to destroy Jesus Christ. That's why in the days of the fourth kingdom, a book totally dedicated to that power being fought by the work of God in the church is the theme of the book of Revelation. And Israel had to be dealt with at the same time. And just like Satan possessed the serpent in the garden, He possessed Rome. And he destroyed the woman's relationship with the word, Jesus Christ. We know that the word of God is Jesus. And the truth that would come forth from God's mouth, the word, is God and was made flesh. And, but praise God, God's word was more powerful than any work of the devil there could possibly be. But the same picture is there. You see the dragon, you see this beast mustering up all its power, and she he's going to attack the woman again. But who's the woman? It's the whole repeated picture all over again. The woman and the beast. The beast, possessed by Satan, adulterates the woman. And in this case, the beast is Rome, and seeks to destroy the pure woman. And the pure woman is clothed with the sun. The moon is beneath her feet. She's crowned with 12 stars and escapes the dragon. This Eve, so to speak, wasn't going to be corrupted like the first Eve was, just like the last man, Adam, would not fall like the first Adam did. And there is that woman being attacked by the dragon, just like Eve in the book of Genesis was attacked by the serpent. 
And the Bible tells us that dragon is the old serpent. It's the same monster. Now, the beast can't get the pure woman, so he deceives another, Jerusalem. Jerusalem was adulterated by the beast, deceived. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 4, if our gospel be hid, Paul said, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, if you read chapter 3, Paul is talking about Israelite people who only stick to the law of Moses. And he says, when Moses is read, there's a veil on their hearts. But when their heart turns to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And we look at Jesus' face, not like Moses who is veiled, but Jesus' face that's open or unveiled. And we are changed into that same image from glory to glory. That's in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. And then when he goes into chapter 4, He's keeping that in mind where the Jewish people that only will look at Moses won't accept Jesus Christ. Their minds are blinded by the God of this world so that the light of that glorious gospel that changes us, and it says that's why he's in the image of God because we're changed into that image according to 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. And the devil's afraid of that image. That's why it repeats it in chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. Lest... The light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And if you read verse 6, it says, Because God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's referring back to Genesis. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, is referring to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and he commanded light to shine. Look at the awesome parallel that's coming together with all of what we're talking about in prophecy tonight and the book of Genesis. And in Revelation 17, verses 3 to 4, we're now past chapter 12, we're past chapter 13, we're in chapter 17, and John is taken into the wilderness and sees this woman on a scarlet-colored beast. She's got names of blasphemy, seven heads and ten horns are on this beast. And the woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet, decked with gold, precious stones and pearls. These aren't the colors of the Roman Catholic Church. Go to Ezekiel chapter 16 and find out that Jerusalem was given gold and jewels a jewel on her forehead and bracelets and rings of gold and earrings. By God, in Ezekiel 16, Israel, Jerusalem had these things. And it was all a personification of the tabernacle, where the tabernacle was made with these things. He said in, in Ezekiel 16, I shod you, I put shoes on your feet of badger skins. And badger skins were the outward fence around the tabernacle. And so... This isn't the Catholic Church. It's not a one-world church. It's not a one-world deal. You talk about people afraid of a one-world church. They have that idea because it's a misinterpretation of chapter 17 of Revelation, making them think that some huge denomination in the world today is this harlot. But it's not. It's back in the first century. And I'm going to show that to you. And spiritually speaking, it rhymes and it chimes with Genesis when it was talking about the beast and the woman in the garden. And, and it'll show you a far more solid foundation of word of God for this idea than these modern interpretations that can't make that kind of comparison. And there's what John saw, a harlot. She's got that cup in her hand full of the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ and the prophets. Purple, scarlet, riding that beast. Now, the beast is Rome. We've already established that in Daniel and in Revelation. And this harlot is riding this beast of Rome. Watch this. Jesus Christ identified that whore. And this came out in an earlier lesson in our studies. But in Matthew 23, verses 35 to 37, he's talking to Jerusalem as you read at the very bottom of that verse. 
that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. Keep that in mind. That's why I emboldened it. And that's why we colored it, highlighted it yellow. All the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of Zacharias, or rather Abel, unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechiah, whom you slew, and he's talking to somebody that slew, between the temple and the altar, verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this. The one I'm talking to, Jesus said, you people, this generation. And he names it, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And in Revelation 17 and 6, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. See that? And the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And in 18 and 24, he uses the same terms that Jesus used in Matthew 23 and 35. In her was the blood of prophets, saints, and all that were slain upon the earth. Jesus said, all the righteous blood shed on the earth. Now, two parties can't have all of the same thing. You can't say that, for example, a church that came after John the Revelator wrote the book of Revelation that killed a lot of people is, uh, has all the blood shed on the earth in her because Jesus already said all the blood shed on the earth was in Jerusalem. The best you could say about some church centuries after John wrote Revelation is they had part of the blood, but you can't say they had all. So it doesn't even make sense because Revelation 18 doesn't say part. It says all. And the only logical conclusion you could come to, biblically speaking, is that the all in Revelation 18 and 24 is the all of Matthew 23 and 35. It's Jerusalem that Jesus identified in Matthew 23 and 37. Jerusalem was named and identified by comparing Scripture with Scripture with the harlot of Revelation. And that's why John 1 and 11 says he came unto his own and his own received him not. Look in Zechariah 9 and 9. Prophecy of Jesus coming to his own people. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. So Jerusalem, the daughter of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem, was Jesus Christ's people, his own. He came as the Son of God to his bride. In John 19 and 15, but they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? Even Pilate knew Jesus was their king. The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. There it is. Adultery with Rome. Just like the woman took the lie from the serpent and spiritually speaking, receive that into her heart like adultery. Jerusalem, the woman, said her king was Caesar. Rome, the fourth beast. It's the beast all over again, giving a word, adulterating the woman away from Jesus Christ, away from God. They chose a pagan king who actually believed that he was God over Jesus Christ, Caesar. And that, in God's mind, is adultery. You see, for if it's the Roman Catholic Church, like some people think it is, or some other one-world church, you have to have been the actual bride of Christ in order to commit adultery away from him. And these people, Jerusalem, were the people of God. It says in the Bible, in Zechariah 9 and 9, your king is coming. And Pilate even witnesses with it. This is your king. Are you going to crucify him? And that idea of Bible saying, I mean, these other bodies and entities came long after the Bible was written. They don't have this kind of substantiation for the word identifying them as Jerusalem has been identified. And so all of the scripture, it's self-contained, it's self-evident that it's talking about Jerusalem. When you just unlearn a bunch of man's traditions and man's ideas, get that out of your mind and stick to the word of God. Now the apostles actually said the Romans were the kings of the earth who were quote unquote together 
with the Jews and with Israel. Now, remember, the harlot was riding the beast, and we know the beast is Rome. Well, Jerusalem rode upon Rome to fight Jesus Christ. When you go to Acts chapter 4, verses 26 to 27, the kings of the earth stood up. Now, remember, Revelation 17 said that the whore that sat on many waters committed fornication with the kings of the earth. Well, the same phrase, and this is powerful, the same phrase is used in Acts chapter 4 in a prayer, that the kings of the earth stood up. The rulers, let's find out who they are. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, for of a truth, against his holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed. Now they're praying to the Lord. Herod, there's a, he's identifying the kings of the earth. Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. And so now we've got even more substantial foundation saying that Jerusalem really is this harlot. And all of this occurred in the first century because now you're reading in the book of Acts chapter 4 where they're actually identifying the kings of the earth as the Roman leaders of the first century. Now, I would sooner take the interpretation of the apostles who are inspired by the Spirit of God to write what they did and to say in this prayer what they said in Acts chapter 4 when they called Herod and Pilate the kings of the earth. Then I would some modern day comparison that's not going to books of the Bible and scriptures like this to interpret Revelation. And after Revelation says the kings of the earth committed fornication with it. What you're reading in Acts 4, when you read that Herod and Pontius Pilate were with the Gentiles, that's that beast system. And the people of Israel together. There's the adultery. God's people Israel together with this Roman beast. And he came to his own people. They were his bride. She was his queen. And she was committing adultery with this beast receiving a lie of a word. And what was the biggest lie? What big lie can you compare with God's own people believing a lie that Jesus isn't their king, Caesar is their king? You couldn't get a worse lie. The kings of the earth were gathered together just like in the book of Revelation. Oh my, can you see how this is paralleling with Genesis and the beast deceiving the woman. It's, hap it's like a new Genesis is occurring. Even the negative parts repeated themselves. I've often preached to our congregations that there's a new Genesis. God's saying, let there be light and we're born. The water, the spirit moved on the water and the word of God were born of the water and the word and the spirit. They all agree in one. And, and that's, you can't be uh, born into the kingdom except you be born of water and spirit baptism in the name of Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit baptism. And all of that is in Genesis. But also in Genesis was this negative side of it with the beast and the woman. And that's in the book of Acts, just as much as being born of the water and spirit is in the book of the Acts. How powerful is that, folks? That's why Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, had Peter talking about two things. The Spirit being outpoured on the day of Pentecost and that same generation, which is 40 years, an untoward generation, he actually called it in Acts chapter 2, experiencing the smoke and pillars of fire and, and Holocaust, right side by side in Acts chapter 2 with Pentecost. And the Holocaust was in 70 AD when Rome, that beast, destroyed the very woman that was riding its back. And that's why Revelation 17 says, in Revelation 18, the beast threw the woman off its back and burned her with fire. Jerusalem was using Rome to crucify Jesus and appealed to Herod and appealed to Pilate and told them to crucify Jesus because their king wasn't Jesus Christ. Their king was Caesar. She was using Rome to do away with Jesus. And in the book of Acts, they appealed to Rome to persecute Paul the Apostle and to persecute. They, they told the Roman governors that, for example, Paul was preaching a false, crazy message. And, and 
using Rome, riding the beast back to destroy Jesus Christ and the church, his body. Now, Jerusalem was the former bride in Ezekiel 16 and 1 to 2. And this is where I told you, look at the jewels. And I'll show you that here in a moment again. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. Now, remember Revelation 17? Abominations of the earth were on the forehead of that woman, that harlot. Well, here we're seeing the same word, abominations, that's identified with Jerusalem. And when you look down in verse 8, when I passed by thee and looked on thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered, covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. That was a poetic version of God taking Israel to Mount Sinai in the wilderness out of Egypt and bringing her into the new covenant like a marriage. But in verse 15, you trusted in your own beauty. You played the harlot. He actually calls her a harlot. He actually says her abominations are there, just like Revelation 17, because of thy renown and pourest out thy fornications. He, now he's talking about fornications on everyone that passed by. His it was. And he actually mentions the Assyrians. He mentions the Egyptians. He mentions uh, the Canaanites. If you keep reading Ezekiel 16, she's committing fornication with all the kings of the earth. He said, you became mine. And in verse 16, of thy garments thou didst take and deckest thy high places with diverse colors and plates the harlot thereon. Like the like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels by the way, oh, God just showed me something. The like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. In other words, this was not going to be repeated again. If people claim that a certain denomination of the church world that's in existence today is the harlot, when Ezekiel is saying that the harlot was Jerusalem and she took all her trappings and colors and jewels and so forth and played the harlot and said it would never happen again like this, this idea of this modern denomination can't be the harlot. This picture will not be repeated again. That was done with Jerusalem. In other words, God, it might be man and their fanciful ideas and, and dispensationalism and all their doctrines today, but it's not God applying this to anything afterwards other than Jerusalem. He said, thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and of my silver, which I had given thee. You see, this is the jewels God gave this harlot, this woman that became a harlot. She was actually his bride at one time. You know what this reminds me of? Hosea and Gomer. Do you remember Hosea represented God when he was told to get a harlot and marry her? Because God's bride had become a harlot. And then when Hosea's wife ran back out into a harlotry again, God said, Hosea, go bring her back. And, and Hosea brings her back. And God says, that's what I would do to my bride, Israel. But she won't come back. He's calling her and it's screaming out from the agony of God's heart all through the Old Testament. My bride became a harlot. And that's what Revelation is talking about. He said, thou hast also taken thy fair jewels, my gold, my silver, which I gave you and madest to thyself images of men and didst commit whoredom with them. There's the adultery. He's calling this Jerusalem. Verse 1 said this was Jerusalem. And verse 20, Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms? He's calling Jerusalem this a small matter. Verse 22, And in all thine abominations and whoredoms, exactly what Revelation 17 is saying, the harlot with the abominations of the earth, all thine abominations, thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, when thou wast naked and barren, wast polluted in thy blood. You don't remember when I took you out of the wilderness, and I made you my people, my bride. He's saying in verse 1, this is Jerusalem. If you were to take what the Bible says is the whore, if you were to take what the Bible says about a whore committing fornication and adultery, and take what the Bible says about a whore with all her jewels, like Revelation 17 is describing, then you'd have to conclude it has to be Jerusalem. Because like I said, and like this scripture said earlier, the like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. In other words, won't be anything similar happen later, as far as God is concerned. 
Oh my, folks, don't let the enemy deceive your hearts into thinking it's something else. The greatest hurt that ever hit God's heart is not some modern denomination that was never involved with him to begin with. It was something that genuinely was involved with him in the old covenant, his people, Jerusalem. And they broke his heart. If somebody does something worse and does something atrocious with their bride and so forth, it would hurt us all if we heard about it. But if our bride had something experienced that was so devastating, that would be more than anything else in existence that could bother us so much. And that's why this issue has to be talking about Jerusalem's genuine brideship with God. And when she turned into a harlot, like Ezekiel says from chapter 16, verse 1 down to the end. And in verse 25, you built your high places at every head of the way. You made your beauty to be abhorred and you've opened thy feet to everyone that passed by and multiplied. And there's the word again. How many times has Ezekiel 16 said this? Thy whoredoms. Verse 26, you've also committed fornication with the Egyptians. See, that was a world power at one time, kings of the earth. Thy neighbors, great of flesh, and has increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. And it's all Jerusalem. He says in verses 28 to 34, you've also played the whore also with the Assyrians. There's another set of kings of the earth. Because thou wast insatiable, yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, more kings of the earth, and yet thou wast not satisfied herewith. How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman, and that thou buildest thine eminent places in the head of every way, makest thine high place in every street, and hast not been as a harlot in that thou scornest higher, but as a wife that commits adultery. He said, this isn't any ordinary harlot here. This is a man's wife committing harlotry, which takes strangers instead of her husband. They give gifts to all whores, but thou givest gifts to all thy lovers. This is like backwards. These Strangers give gifts to whores, but this is the whore paying the man. And, and it's how, how ugly and hateful and hurtful to God's heart could anything be like this. That's what Revelation 17 is talking about, folks. Not some idea of what's happening now in the world. He said, you gave your gifts to your lovers, you hired them that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. And the contrary is in thee from other women in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms. And in that thou givest a reward, no reward is given unto thee. Therefore thou art contrary. He said, none of the other whores on earth do this, but you're more evil and more dark and turned to wickedness more than any harlot has ever been in existence. You are chasing and you are going and you are paying. He said, as a wife, you're committing adultery. Can you feel the ache in God's heart? No wonder John was so attacked and, and hit when he saw this vision. Now, Jeremiah, not just Ezekiel, witnesses of Jerusalem being the harlot as well. In Jeremiah 2, verse 1, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem. Can you feel God's pain, folks? Can you feel what God's going through? Saying, thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness. This is just like Ezekiel 16. I found you in the wilderness. I made you mine. In a land that was not sown, Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. And in chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, they say, If a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? He said, This isn't very common. Men usually don't do this. They, they don't want their land to be polluted. But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me. He said, People won't even hardly do this. But he said, I will. You've done it many times. And think of what he said in Ezekiel. You've done this with the kings of the earth, the Assyrians, the Philistines, the, the, the Canaanites, the, the Egyptians. Many, many. And she went out hiring lovers instead of them hiring her. 
contrary, and as a wife committeth adultery, not like a normal whore. But he said, yet return again to me. Look at how much God has love for them. Lift up thine eyes to the high places. See where thou hast not been lean with, in the ways that thou sat for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness. And thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. And thou hadst a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. A whore's forehead? Doesn't that sound like Revelation chapter 17, where on her forehead was written... And Jeremiah 3 and 3 compares with Revelation 17 and 5. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. We're going to shift gears here. And I, I, I hope you felt the impact of what God's trying to say. Don't let anybody con you spiritually and tell you that the horror in Revelation is anything other than first century Jerusalem when Jesus came for his bride. And I emphasize first century Jerusalem because she was destroyed in 70 AD. And I know a lot of people might disagree with me, some of you even watching this, but I don't believe Jerusalem today even fits the category anymore. I believe it was first century Jerusalem and she's gone now as far as God is concerned. And so no Jewish person today fits that picture. And I think now it's, it's just a sad state where we need to pray for Israel. And, and those people to come into the church of God. But look at this, the high priest. All of the blue, the purple, the scarlet, the gold, and the fine twine linen in his robes were referred to in Exodus chapter 28 and verse 2. Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother. And he called them for glory and for beauty. But in Leviticus chapter 16 verses 2 and verse 4, when the high priest would go into the holiest of holies to make atonement once a year, it says, into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. He shall put on the holy linen coat, the white, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and he shall be girded with a linen girdle and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. None of that glory and beauty, the gold, the purple, the red, the scarlet, was on when he went into the holiest. When he went into the holiest, it took me a while to find this picture because a lot of people don't know the Bible so detailingly as this. To find a picture of him without the blue, the scarlet, the gold, and the purple. Only the white linen, he went in there. Because the other colors represented glory and beauty, and man shall not glory in his presence. By the way, let me throw this in here. Did you ever hear that legend? Because that's all it is, is a ridiculous legend of a rope tied to the ankle of the high priest that you'll never read in the Bible anywhere, hint, hint, that if he should go in and hadn't done his ritual properly to be holy and died, because it said that he die not, that because they couldn't go behind the veil, lest they die themselves to rescue his body, they would pull him out by the rope tied to his ankle. That's nonsense. They said if they stopped hearing the bells at the bottom of his hem ring, then he died. He didn't wear the bells when he went into the holy place. They weren't there. They were part of the gold, the purple, the scarlet, and all of these colors, the blue, that represented glory and beauty that he couldn't have on there. So don't believe that nonsense that there was a rope around his ankle that they pulled him out with. That's not Bible. That's nonsense. But let's go on. Aaron's garments have the same colors and material that the tabernacle was made from. Now I'm bringing out a point here. His garments were noted immediately after the tabernacle material was described in Exodus 28 and 2. And you'll find all the same colors were there. The gold, the blue, the purple, the scarlet, and fine twine linen. So it was like he was dressing like the most holy place when he was in normal ministry work amongst the people. He was representing the glory of God. He was glory and beauty, representative 
when he was with the people. But when he himself went away from the people with only God in there, in the holiest of holies over the Ark of the Covenant, he could only go in with linen. He could not wear the deckings of gold and beauty before the Lord because obviously he won't represent the Lord in front of the Lord himself. And in 1 Corinthians 1 and 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence is a spiritual principle that I believe applies here. Now, Jerusalem was given tabernacle and temple glory. Very similarly. In Ezekiel 16 and 3, notice again, he's talking to Jerusalem. Verse 10 says, I clothed thee also with broidered work, shod thee with badger skins. There's the tents. Outer fence, the badger skins. I girded thee about with fine linen. Notice that. That was part of the tabernacle. I decked thee also with ornaments. I put bracelets on your hand, chains on your neck, a jewel on your forehead. This is God talking. Earrings in your ears, a beautiful crown on your head. You were decked with gold and silver, and the raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. but she glorified herself with it. According to Ezekiel 16 and 15, you trusted in your own beauty. You played the harlot. You committed fornications. In Revelation 17 and 4, now you understand why we read, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. You're paralleling Ezekiel 16 and Revelation 17 if you're studying the Bible correctly. Isn't this powerful? And in Revelation 18 and 7, how much has she glorified herself and lived deliciously? She wouldn't humble herself before the Lord of glory, but abused the jewelry of glory and beauty for herself. And then when we read Isaiah, we've been to Ezekiel, we've been to Genesis, we've been to Jeremiah, and now we're going to Isaiah. Isaiah 29 and 1. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwells. Jerusalem was called Ariel in Isaiah. Add ye year to year, let them kill sacrifices, yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as Ariel. And I will encamp against thee round about, will lay siege against thee with a mount, and I will raise forts against thee. That's exactly what happened in AD 70. Rome was used to do this. Look at how the Bible is confirming all of this. Chapter 29 and 10, the Lord hath poured upon you the spirit of deep sleep, hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. Verse 11, the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that has learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it's sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, not, he saith I am not learned. And the eyes closed, the book sealed. Doesn't that sound like something else in the New Testament? Revelation 5 verses 1 to 2, in the right hand of him that sat on the throne was a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And a cry was made, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? He's talking about Jerusalem and the Jews. He's constantly contrasting how they're not only the whore and the harlot that used to be his bride, his people. But now the book is sealed to them. And that's exactly what you see in Revelation. He said, I can't. It's sealed. He's talking to Ariel. Remember Isaiah 29 started talking about Jerusalem as Ariel? And now we're seeing Jerusalem being associated with a book that's sealed and they're unable to understand it. And the Gentiles are represented in chapter 29, verse 12. It's given to them that aren't learned. The people that are learned are the Jews. They should have known, but they were blinded. And the people that are not learned, the Gentiles. You see how this is all coming together. But the point is, Jerusalem was blinded. And in Romans 11 and 7, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded? Have you ever connected Romans 11 with Revelation? 
You see how all these scriptures, this is what almost threw me off my chair when I saw this. More scriptures come together with this view than any other view I've ever witnessed. And I've studied a lot of them. And verse 8, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day, unto the day when Romans was written by Paul. And that all is referenced in Isaiah 29 and 10. The Lord hath poured upon you the spirit of deep sleep, closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. And Isaiah 29 associates all of that with a sealed book that they can't see, which is exactly what Revelation is about. Pinpointing, like Paul said in Romans 11, his day or the first century. As it is unto this day. He's talking about the first century the spirit of deep sleep. And Paul refers to the chapter that speaks of Jerusalem's destruction, Isaiah 29. Remember he said, I'll lay siege about thee. There'll be a fort on every side. That's exactly what happened in AD 70. And all of this has a connection to the sealed book in the book of Revelation. He's quoting Isaiah. The sealed book is part of the gospel mystery. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, how that by revelation... He made known unto me the mystery. You see, when something is sealed and hidden from you, like a sealed book, it's a mystery. But the opposite of a mystery is a revelation. And some people actually believe no one can properly understand revelation. That's the most ridiculous statement I've ever heard in my life as a minister, studying the book of Revelation and prophecy. To call a book called Revelation... It's like it needs to be called the book of the mystery, according to them, because no one can understand it. But by revelation means unveiling or revealing, not hiding as in a mystery. The mystery is made known by revelation. The entire book called Revelation is not supposed to be a mystery. John was told, don't seal the book. Daniel was told to seal it because you can't understand it, Daniel. But he told John, don't seal it. This is to be understood. And people are sealing it in the minds of Christians by telling them you can't understand Revelation. They're actually helping the work of the enemy out. That's why I put on social media recently. It's one of the most dangerous thoughts you could come out with. You can't understand Revelation. That's like you can't understand something revealed because that's what Revelation means. And verse 4, Ephesians says, Wherever, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery. I know the mystery, Paul said, of Jesus Christ. And verse 5 says, Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by his Spirit. You know, a lot of legalism in today's church world comes from old covenant thinking. And new covenant thinking is not a bunch of thou shalt nots, like there were 10 thou shalt nots. It's thou shalt, it's blessed are thee. And there are nine of them. Blessed are this, blessed, are, and there's nine of those. And, and not only that, but old covenant thinking is when Daniel had a sealed book and he couldn't understand. And people are trying to bring even that into the New Testament church people and tell them it's still sealed. You can't understand Revelation. One person actually told me a few years ago, I'm not listening to anything you say because nobody can understand Revelation. And I could not believe it. It's like there's that Old Testament legalism again in a very odd form that you wouldn't expect. But it's the same thing, same spirit. It's revealed. It wasn't made known to ages when sons of men lived back in those times. But it's now revealed by his Spirit. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Fellow heirs with who? Israel. We are now citizens of Israel in the eyes of God. And like I said recently, we're more Jewish than a Jew that rejects Jesus. Read Galatians 4 and find out Jews that rejected Jesus were called Ishmael, but Gentiles and Jews who accepted Jesus, including Gentiles, were Isaac. We're more Jewish than an unbelieving Jew. And in verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad it's revealed now? 2 Corinthians 3 and 15, but even unto this day when Moses is read, there's that old covenant sticking to that, legalism. 
the veils on their hearts. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. The revelation will occur. In Romans 11 and 25, this also needs to be discussed. What is referred to as the fullness of the Gentiles. I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. It's in part because not all Israel was blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So is that blindness still there as though the fullness of the Gentiles hasn't even come yet? Let's kill another sacred calf and have a barbecue. Luke 21 and 24. They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem, this is Jesus talking, shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. People are throwing this into our future as though it's still the time of the Gentiles. No, it's not the time of the Gentiles now. Let me show you. Revelation 11 and 2 tells us how long the times of the Gentiles would be. The court which is without the temple leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. Now, let me explain this. In this vision, John saw the temple, and he was told to measure the temple. But the court that's outside the temple, and by the way, it's called the court of the Gentiles, don't measure it. And that was a symbol that the court that's measured or rather not measured, the Gentiles are, are, are safe. But it says the holy city, the Gentiles would tread under their feet 40 and two months. So that temple itself represented the city Jerusalem. The outer court represents the Gentiles. And those Gentiles would tread that temple down. They'd tread Jerusalem under its feet for 42 months. How long was it? Jesus said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The new book of Revelation says it's three and a half years. It's not 2,000 years. The times of the Gentiles is three and a half years. And that Gentiles represents the kings of the earth, the Babylon, the Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And in the days of the fourth kingdom, the times of the Gentile kingdoms, there was going to be a three and a half year stomping down of Jerusalem. That is the duration of the time of the Gentiles. And blindness, according to Romans 11 and 25, would happen until that comes in. That means there's no more blindness. You see, God blinded first century Israel and Jerusalem because they rejected Jesus. Put a spirit of slumber upon them, like Isaiah 29 spoke about, which Romans 11 refers to, directly quotes Isaiah. And that blindness... The sins of the fathers don't carry down to their children. You can't say that Jewish people today are blinded because of their daddies. In fact, Jeremiah, Ezekiel 18 says, the fathers have eaten grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. You know how sour grapes makes your teeth set on edge? That will no longer be a parable for Israel because the sins of the fathers will not be put on their children. You can't say the people that crucified Jesus, their descendants today are suffering because of it. That is not true. Ezekiel 18 says that can't be true and it's specifically talking about Israel. And so if they're blinded, it's not because of the blindness for rejecting Jesus that their forefathers experienced. It's just a general blindness as somebody from Toronto experiences if they don't believe. So, folks, this is so important to understand. Praise God. Now, remember, Daniel saw four Gentile kingdoms. The last kingdom was Rome. The fullness of the Gentiles was when Gentile kingdoms would com be completed in their purpose of God to afflict Jerusalem. All those kingdoms afflicted Israel. All of them. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Some were better than uh, on Israel than the predecessors, but they still had Israel under their thumb. And treading is exactly what Jesus referred to as Jerusalem being trodden down, the holy city, by the Gentiles. Gentiles is mentioned in both by Jesus and the book of Revelation. So that generation only was blinded. In 2 Corinthians 3 and 13, and not like Moses who put a veil over his face that the children of Israel should not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. 
for until this day, the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is on their heart. Nevertheless, when it turns to the Lord, the veil will be taken away. And in chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 of 2 Corinthians, if our gospel's hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Blinded until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's all that one generation. Until three and a half years of Jerusalem's destruction takes place. We're getting heavy, intensely into the meat of word tonight, folks. John 12 and 37, But though he had done so many miracles before them, the Bible says concerning Jesus, yet they believed not on him. And verse 38, That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, saying, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. And in verse 41, these things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. And that's in Isaiah chapter 6. And if you read the end of Isaiah chapter 6, when he says, whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, send me. He says, Isaiah, you go preach till there be no more cities until the cities are wasted. He's talking about A.D. 70 just like Jesus was, talking about the Jews in his day were blinded and they would stay blinded until there's no more city. Preach, he said Isaiah, until there's no more city. That represents the church giving forth the gospel until Jerusalem was flattened and smashed. They were blinded because they rejected Jesus. It all points to the cross. It all points to the lifetime of those people in Jesus' day and their children. The time frame immediately following the cross. 40 years, one generation. And watch this. I'm coming down to the close now. In Romans 11, verses 25 to 26. After he's talking about all this blindness, and if they, they'd turn their hearts and the blindness would be lifted, he said, I would not, brethren, you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. In other words, you need a revelation. Let this not be a mystery to you. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so, all Israel shall be saved. Now, what's that mean? And so, all Israel. He didn't say, after which, all Israel shall be saved. He said, and so. It totally changes the whole meaning. People generally think after. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Let's study what and so is referring to. Many read this and think that blindness happens to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And they think that hasn't even happened yet. And after that, all Israel shall be saved. After the resurrection, after the rapture, all Israel be saved. The devil would like us to believe that because if we don't think God can save Israel now because they're blind, we won't preach to Israel. We won't preach to Jews. We won't give them this apostolic message. We'll think... It's not for them. The resurrection's got to take us away. Because after the resurrection, folks, no one gets a chance to be saved by any means at all. It's right to the right throne, white throne judgment. And I've got more lessons to talk about this in detail, but I want to throw this in right now. There's no millennium after the resurrection. The millennium in Revelation 20 represents what we're going through now. Thousand is a figurative number in Revelation and means a long time. And the Bible says, there were people sitting on thrones and judgment was given to them. Folks, we're seated with Christ right now in heavenly places, ruling with them. The kingdom has already started since the day of Pentecost. You're born of the water and the spirit to get into the kingdom. The kingdom's been here for 2,000 years. There's not a coming kingdom age. We're in the kingdom age. That's what people are starting to realize and waking up and getting a hold of Jewish people, getting a hold of Israel because of this false idea that needs to get out of our heads that says after the church is resurrected, all Israel, as though the fullness of the Gentiles is the rapture. The church is not a rapture of Gentiles. The church isn't Gentiles, so if you rapture the church, as if you're rapturing the Gentiles out in the time of the Gentiles, it's not a church time for just Gentiles. Ephesians 2 says that Jews and Gentiles are together now in one body. Where did people come up with the idea that the church is Gentile? And so, look at this. Fullness of the Gentiles. 
It's not saying the fullness of all Gentiles who ever be saved will come in, and then the resurrection occurs. Rapture is nowhere in Romans 11. It's saying that the fullness of Gentile years are going to be finished. And in Luke 21 and 24, they shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captive in all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So, and so, let's read it this way now, as though it means, and in that manner. Because that's what and so means. It doesn't mean after, it means in that manner. Paul said the remnant of Israel was being saved and would be saved, while the rest are blinded. He said he himself was a Jew. He was the remnant. That's why Israel in part was blinded, because people like John and Paul that were Jewish weren't blinded. God didn't cast them away. Romans 10 and 9, if you confess with your mouth, this is the chapter just before Revelation, Romans 11, the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is talking about Jews if you read Revelation, or I keep saying Revelation, Romans 10. They went about to establish their own righteousness and never submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. He's saying if they'll only believe in their hearts this message, this word of faith from Deuteronomy 30, they'll be saved. It's about Israel, but they didn't. So he says in that manner that Romans 10 and 9 says, that's how all Israel is saved, confessing with their mouth. You can't cut off chapter 10 from chapter 11. In what manner? You've got to read before Romans 11 and 26 information to provide us what the manner is when he says, and so, in that manner, all Israel shall be saved. Verse 14 and 15, if, Paul even said it. He wouldn't say this if he believed all the Jews couldn't be saved. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting of the way of them be the reconciliation of the world, what will be the receiving of them but life from the dead? Paul wouldn't think he could save some of them if they're all blinded until the resurrection. The remnant counts as the whole. And so where did the idea come from that says the time of the Gentiles refers to a period when Gentiles are saved? It didn't come from the Bible. Dispensationalism started that idea. And it's not Bible. There's only one generation of Jews that were blinded because they rejected Jesus. And that was the one that directly rejected him. He didn't curse the whole race of Jewish people. That is the most ungodly thing that people have got to get away from their minds. Aside from that single cursed generation, remember he cursed the fig tree? Jews and Gentiles all have equal opportunity for salvation. He didn't blind the entire race and all their succeeding generation for one generation's cursing. The cross paid for everybody's salvation and the generation who rejected him and crucified him turned their backs themselves and they were given over. And Revelation says they repented not, which tells us they could have repented. It's dispensationalism or sensationalism's error. Let your mind meditate on that little play on words for a while. So there you have it. The mother of harlots, Jerusalem, from a solid Bible foundation. They're the ones that the cup of the wrath of God was poured on in A.D. 70. There's the temple. Remember in Ezekiel? represented the bride, the church, that was destroyed. And it was all because Jerusalem, that holy city, was riding the back of that beast. And when that beast threw her off his back and burned her with fire, that's exactly what happened in AD 70. The same entity and beast that she was riding to fight Jesus Christ first and then the church through the whole book of Acts. And in Revelation 17 and 16, the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, make her desolate. He allowed her to ride him. But then finally he would hate her and naked and shall eat her flesh, burn her with fire for God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Like God sent Assyria against Israel. In Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5 to 6, O Assyrian, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hand is my indignation. 
I will send them against a hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath. God said he would send them. I will give them a charge to take the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Jerusalem shall be trodden down. It's the destruction of Jerusalem using the wrath of God and his weapon, Rome. Rome was like a weapon in his hand, the rod, the staff of his indignation. He often used heathen armies and said he came in wrath, as in Isaiah 42 and 24. Who gave Jacob for a spoil in Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. Therefore, he's poured upon him the fury of his anger, giving Jacob to these other robbers. And the strength of battle, and it has set him on fire round about, yet he knew not, and it burned him, yet he laid it not to heart. But isn't it wonderful There's a pure woman. That woman that turned into a harlot was the old wife, the old bride. But there's a new one, the new Jerusalem. Revelation 21 and 2, I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. The old Jerusalem used to be the holy city. But there's a new one now, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. She's not going to do what the first one did. Just like the church, the new Eve, isn't going to do what the first Eve did in Genesis. And in verse 9, Come hither, I'll show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. Doesn't that feel so good to read those words? The holy Jerusalem. After you read how wicked the old Jerusalem really was, descending out of heaven from God. It's not from this world, folks. The church is from heaven. And then that vision of that cube city coming down represents the bride. And in Hebrews 12 and 22, he told us 2,000 years ago, you are come. You're not going there. This isn't something that hasn't happened yet. You are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Folks, There's not a cube in space going to come down to the planet Earth. That's all a vision symbolizing the church's origin was from heaven. And you know what the streets of gold are? Gold represents purity. And the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That's what the gold street means. I had a pastor way back in the 70s. And he had that belief that the city's symbolic. And I kind of laughed at it after. But I realize now he was right. The heavenly Jerusalem, we've already come to it. Innumerable company of angels, the general assembly of church of the firstborn. Have you come to the church of the firstborn? You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. In Matthew 5 and 14, he already tried to tell us when Jesus said, you're the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill. And in Galatians 4 and 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Folks, it's the church. Thank God for the church of the living God. Hallelujah, Lord, I praise you, God. I give you glory with my brothers and sisters watching this tonight. I give you thanks and and just praise you for all you've done. I I hope this has blessed you so much. Uh, We're going to open this up now. I know we've been longer than usual, an hour and a half, but this has been an extra specially anointed message, and I'm sure you'll agree with me. And so after this note, get ready if you have any comments or questions for us.